You are listening to The Audio Project with Dina Tierney. This podcast is recorded from my office in downtown Honolulu and welcomes you to join in the conversations I have on technology, business, and all things Salesforce. Today, I have Blaine Kaho'one. Did I say it right? You did. Oh my oh God, my I gosh. practiced it for so long. One <laughs> shot hit out of the park. Cool. All right. Wow. So thank you for being our guest on today's audio project. A um, real pleasure. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank you. So Blaine, you and I met just recently. And um, it was funny because after we met, I walked away from our conversation and I thought like, how is it possible that we did not meet? I, like, how did our paths not cross you know, earlier, given yeah. our CRM connection, of course, the Hawaii connection. Yes. Um, but I'm really glad to have met you. And I think for our audience, if you don't mind giving a little intro to your background, uh, what your job is. Um, yep. Yeah. How you got here. Same. Um, I guess the big question is how far back do you want me to start? <laughs> the Salesforce background or well, before I, Salesforce? Let's start with what you do now. Let's start <laughs> okay. with that. Okay. So currently I serve as a director of alliances for Salesforce in a specific area called our platform division. Uh, so at Salesforce, these are uh, products and services that we offer that allow customers to build custom solutions on our platform. So I've been working in that group for the last three three years plus, um, currently managing consulting partnerships like yours, mm -hmm. um, but also in some cases, technology partnerships uh, that help foster the use of Salesforce's platform to solve problems for Salesforce customers. So I've been doing that for uh, three plus years. Um, in next month actually makes my 16th anniversary of time at Salesforce. That's awesome. Uh, don't know how I made it. <laughs> uh, probably lots of coffee and other things. <laughs> That's great. But um, yeah, it's so needed. <laughs> it was definitely needed. Uh, and so I've spent a lot of years with Salesforce really on a career development path uh, around partnerships. I really found partnerships as being my forte. Um, but prior to that, um, I also was involved in direct selling, uh, working with customers on their business needs around, uh, you know, getting closer to their customer, as we say in the customer 360 world. Um, and helping them understand the necessity to align, you know, uh, marketing, sales, and customer service around that client need, right? So I've done that uh, for, again, uh, approaching 16, if I can make it next month. <laughs> and, um, and then uh, prior to that, I actually came from one of the first uh, Salesforce partners, um, a company called Avant Go. For those that are, the millennials would never know this, but... Um, <laughs> Before you actually had iPhones, smartphones, you had Palms and Pocket PCs. And uh, we were the first company to ever put Salesforce on a device, a mobile device. And granted, you had to That's synchronize awesome. it. But um, that was one of two companies, the other one besides Salesforce, in my early career in technology where I was like, oh, my gosh, I have to. Yeah. I have to be in this world somehow. Mm -hmm. um, but prior to that, a couple other startups and, you know, that was back in 99 when I left nice. here. It's very cool. Well, actually, that's what I wanted to dive a little deeper into, um, getting into your career path. So you are native Hawaiian, which is awesome. I am. And so you grew up here on Oahu? Is yes, that right? I did. Okay, cool. So again, kind of take us through the journey um, of high school, call it. I, I guess it's, what do they say here? What school you go? Right, what well, high school you went. <laughs> oh, okay. See, I don't even know how to do it. <laughs> what, what high school you from? Okay. Um, no, it's funny. Uh, yeah, so my native Hawaiian roots actually uh, stem back from the west side of Oahu. Um, okay, nice. Uh, most of our family is actually still there on Waianae, Makaw, um, Nanakuli. Uh, but my family ended up moving earlier on after a small stint or a few years in uh, Honolulu to Kailua. Um, and that's where they had me, but, um, yeah, so I guess fast forward, uh, had a, my school was, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm a Kailua surf rider, so I'm nice. a product of public school. It's funny when I go to the mainland, everybody quickly assumes like, oh, did you go to, um, that college preparatory school, uh, uh Punahou, right? And I'm like, <laughs> no, uh, oh, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, that's right. Uh, that, that native Hawaiian school that, uh, what do you call that? Come, come. <laughs> Kamehameha. Yes. No. Um, 
And I said, well, I'm, I'm a product of public school. That's awesome. And it is definitely possible. <laughs> and um, anyway, so uh, actually had some early, you know, exposures to basic word processing and software, you know, back in the day when they're teaching you how to move from typewriters to mm -hmm. computers and the computers were this big, right? <laughs> um, and, uh, but then slowly but surely, you know, through that and some exposure going, moving on to University of Hawaii and uh, actually, you know, going through the college of, uh, what is it? School of Travel Industry Management. That's what you studied. Um, yes, nice. What, what was I your studied. goal at that point? You know, at the time it was kind of looking at at the industries here and really seeing that, you know, a, a long term career with a large company as it relates to Hawaii could be in, you know, uh, finance, backing, uh, banking, in, uh, engineering or travel <laughs> industry. I chose travel industry. I had a, you know, a, a work history in my early days in F&B. And so um, it's kind of how I pursued the path. Um, but interestingly enough, coming out of that degree, I was like, oh, I don't don't know if this is for me. Mm -hmm. um, and then just through networks and exposure, I got connected with some people that had spent some time on the mainland. So I, you know, I kind of got exposure in tech, funny enough, through investments. And these were people that had gone away to school and then came back home and were in different lines of work, commercial real estate, financial investments. And we just started talking about stocks. <clears throat> <clears throat> wow. And uh, cra crazy enough, this was just before the dot bomb in 99, which is funny <laughs> enough that got me all excited. And I decided to leave Hawaii just before the dot bomb to go check out all this crazy technology. Right. So anyway, we spoke about things like Netscape, like with Internet Explorer, like, oh, this is crazy technology. You know, this browser, you can do yeah, this yeah. thing, get on the Internet. And everybody's like, what's that? And Yahoo. And, you know, there's crazy stocks making all this yeah. money. And I was like, this sounds wild. Like, I don't even, I've never heard of this. So that's kind of how I got exposed to the tech world. So then um, you moved. And then the startups. Yeah. So in 99, I left September 16th. Do you ever feel like you, you started that too late? Like late. Because I, I feel like you, you and I are similarly aged. And so I remember when I entered, I was like, yay, tech, la, la, right, la. Like, right. dot com. And Drank then all of a sudden I'm like, oh my gosh. Exactly. Exactly. I literally got there and I was like, whoa, what's happening? <laughs> Let the bloodletting begin. Like a whole bunch of companies were laying off people yeah. and, you know, uh, uh, venture firms were re revisiting whether or not their investments are really um, sound investments. Uh, it was it was crazy. I mean, at the time there was all this, uh, there was more articles about how big the launch parties were of these <laughs> companies than actual business models oh, yeah. and revenue oh, generation sure. and, you know, <clears throat> and uh, return on investment. So it was it was insane. It was mm -hmm. just like, I can't believe people live this way. You know, this is, I gotta be a part of this. <laughs> so um, yeah, so that's when I left in 99, the first startup, I actually survived three plus years before they started going through their series of layoffs. But it, it was an interesting learning experience because it, it taught me like, okay, there's all these very unique use cases uh, in technology. But then you have to really get back to fundamentals. Fundamentals meaning, does it solve a problem? Does it provide value to a, a customer, prospective customer? Um, and ultimately, can you grow a real business behind it? And so it was just all instantly this like MBA program that I got thrown into starting in 99, even before Salesforce. And then really rubber hit the road when for me, you know, four failed startups before Salesforce as a startup mm -hmm. still. And then you know, luckily being around to help knock that out of the park Yeah. Uh, to what we are today going from, that's crazy, you know, employee 570 to now 50,000. That's so it's crazy. So you've seen the evolution of Salesforce, any highlights, any cool, I know you have some claims to fame that you might want to share, but oh, it's just kind of, I can't remember. I don't, I don't <laughs> know if I can speak to any claims of fame really, but I just survived. I survived. I mean, um, it's crazy to see the evolution career. of the product. I think yes. you and I were talking about this the other day. One of my early customers when I was doing CRM implementations, and it was a client that was um, in Los Angeles in Southern California, yep. and we were doing a global sales team rollout, and their APAC team, I think it was actually their Japan team specifically had flown in, and they were doing, showing us Salesforce that we were moving right. all of them onto the single platform. Uh -huh. 
And when I saw Salesforce, we were kind of like, eh, like chuckling in the background, <laughs> like, oh my God, I can't believe they're using this really right. silly system. And now yeah. it's like, who would have thought yeah. that? I mean, so I was just curious, like, as you've seen the evolution of just Salesforce, yep. I'm sure there's some cool highlights. And if, if not, I mean, if you can't think of anything, it's, yeah, it's, I mean, it's amazing to me. It, it, it was an amazing journey, right? And, and you know, it's funny, Mark, to hear Mark talk about some of that and, and, and the discussion being a little different now at this size but of organization, but he's really held through mm -hmm. uh, in that customer value, yeah. customer success first. I mean, from back in 99 all the way to now, right? And that was actually one of the biggest, also biggest attractors for me. It was like, this company seems to really care about the success of its clientele. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, a lot of amazing <clears throat> stuff that you can read in his books over the years, but fundamental things that have now become kind of table stakes <clears throat> and benchmarks in the tech industry and actually yeah. now transcending outside of the tech industry in terms yeah. of customer references, customer success, right? Yeah. Focusing on a customer trust. value, trust and transparency, mm -hmm. um, and really, uh, um, driving that across the organization with a common belief, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and value system. And it, and it's pretty inspiring, right? And then add to that, you know, the other side of it, um, the philanthropic side, right? Mm -hmm. um, getting involved in communities and volunteering your time and also really putting a structure around you being able to empowering an employee to go and get involved, yeah. right? In, in one's community or in one's kind of... Uh, uh, belief system in that way. Uh, and I just thought that was the coolest thing, mm -hmm. you know, like getting together as team members, getting into the community, volunteering, uh, whether it was, you know, uh, uh, homeless shelters or to, um, you know, church like um, dinners, you know, for less fortunate people to, you know, uh, package kits for, for to toys for disadvantaged individuals or children. It was just amazing, mm -hmm. right? That we all did this as a company. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I'm curious, was that, cause you know, a lot of people that are in the Salesforce ecosystem are super familiar with Mark's 111 model mm -hmm. back in, I mean, from the time that you started, was all of that in place or did it start to be kind of come to life more over the course of the company or how, has it always just been no, there? No, I, I mean, it, I think it was probably in place, maybe not as structured and not as large because yep. the company was definitely, I mean, it was under a thousand employees when yep. I started. Um, but we, you know, we quickly put that framework in and shared that across the organization. Uh, we also, in some cases, we, if I remember correctly, we also got customers themselves involved yep. in some of that volunteer activity. Um, even, I want to say even around like some of our earlier days of, of Dreamforce, for example, we might have like a volunteer session or segment. And and I think we do this, I'm pretty sure we do this now mm -hmm. still is like, we just allow the opportunity for customers that are coming there for our, our annual user conference to really, you know, get involved collectively with Salesforce and the community um, doing a variety of different volunteer projects. And, you know, again, that's just some pretty amazing things that not a lot of companies are doing, uh, weren't doing back then and, and kind of slowly doing more now. Absolutely. Um, and one of those reasons why I'm still here after yeah. 16. Oh, it's a great company. Approaching 16 yeah. years. <laughs> so. Very cool. Um, so speaking of give back, great transition. Want to talk about, um, you know, you and I were talking about Hawaii. I kind of want to transition to Hawaii specifically. Obviously, you have a connection here um, from before. Um, but you're involved in some cool things here in Hawaii. Um, shall we talk about um, Purple Maya F Foundation and how oh. you kind of work on helping to tech enable youth? Because I, that's a great story. By the way, I met some of the guys last night, and they're well, like, did. "Oh, yeah." <laughs> Who, who, who'd you meet? Uh, Victor like Victor? Lee. You yep. met Victor. Victor. Yep. Yeah. So great crew. And they were really, <laughs> um, you know, thinking about how great it is that you're involved. And I don't know, share with our audience what, what it's yeah, all about. Yeah, sure. So um, Purple Maya uh, Foundation is a nonprofit that I've really kind of got behind uh, over the years. It's a, a friend of mine that I went to college with, uh, Donovan Kailua and, and a couple other co-founders, um, with the objective of kind of educating native Hawaiian community around skills and technology, right? And uh, it's often cases an, an underserved community. 
um, but with a vision of <clears throat> trying to incorporate cultural values into also those technology skill sets. Uh, and I, I always value that. I always, anything that helps our native Hawaiian community kind of up level mm -hmm. themselves in their native land is, is something that I'm really impressed upon. And over the years, I try to, whatever mana'o or information I have um, that I can share, I will try to share to at least give them the choice, right? Because oftentimes when it comes to education, it's not often uh, uh, access or availability to make a choice, right? So um, I got involved with that program uh, and I sit on the board now really to try to help provide uh, with the goal of kind of providing a little bit of an operational lens, um, but also, you know, uh, taking certain um, skills, things that we've done, best practices from the Salesforce world in thinking about uh, delivering those skills to, you know, the disadvantaged community. Um, and so I've been really interested in a couple of the programs. The ones that they, they started with were with children. And then they also have uh, what they call the Purple Prize, which they do annually, where applicants can showcase particular kind of business models that follow a, a, a cultural and technology combination definition, if you will. Uh, and it's really cool because they, they give these uh, individuals an opportunity to kind of showcase these, these use cases, these these business propositions, these technologies uh, with a cultural mindfulness um, that could potentially turn into real business models, right? And I, I've always kind of taken that experience of the dot bomb and the, and the Salesforce growth, hyper growth, and you know, exposure to the VC community um, and different individuals in, in, that, you know, in that sense, the Western sense, and trying to build a connection to mm -hmm. that, to, to help uh, these individuals kind of be mindful about when you're looking at business, when you're looking at technology, when you're looking at, um, you know, ultimately investment mm -hmm. in your model. Here's what things certain organizations, investors are really looking at, right? And here's what you have to think about and certain do's and don'ts. And that's kind of been my contribution to uh their efforts and it's just been a lot of fun That's cool. um more recently they they launched uh, an adult program so it kind of takes a similar lens with other individuals that either haven't had exposure to t education and technology would like to do a career change um, and explore how technology skills and jobs in technology could benefit them and they're really trying to frame out um you know teaching those kind of individuals cool. about Salesforce and, you know, potentially beyond, but that could evolve into other things like internships to job placements and partnerships, um, things of that sort, and really give people here the opportunity to build skills in tech. And what's great about tech, and you probably know this as well, is you can be anywhere, right? You can mm -hmm. be here, you could be some other state, you can be some other country and still using technology to conduct day-to-day -day business and thrive. Mm -hmm. economically so yeah, absolutely yeah so how did um because when i and, and maybe it, it felt like at least there's a focus on specifically salesforce skill development mm -hmm. for both young people as well as adults yep. was that under like did you influence that and that kind of came out through how did that come to be i guess i i think to some degree i mean i initially you know with the kids it was always something to pique their interest right it was it, it was starting with basic basic fun, right? Like, let's build a game. Let's get you interested in games, right? Mm -hmm. And using the game, uh, the use case of games as a platform to learn, right? Um, as they pivot to uh, maybe to the adult uh, sector, if you will, um, you know, I think that's where they started looking at certain uh, software, certain enterprises, certain use cases that, hey, what what sort of skills could adults capture, right? And obviously with the success of uh, Salesforce and the prevalence of businesses out there in the world using Salesforce to run their day-to-day -day customer relationships, um, I think they found that as an advantage to kind of say, okay, that market is there, it's mm -hmm. established, it's growing even here in Hawaii. Um, and we could probably, uh, 
you know, offer those kind of skills to empower those individuals to, you know, potentially do things like do those implementation services, either as uh, an employee, as a contractor, as an entrepreneur, right? And that's kind of that whole three-tiered up-leveling uh, goal that we have in mind. And so, yeah, Salesforce um, is kind of one of those things where we think there's opportunity, mm -hmm. but I'm sure we can explore even beyond that, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I'm obviously from a Salesforce perspective, I'm ex when I heard about it and I got to learn a little more after last night too, just talking with Victor and um, some of the others that were there, um, our clients, and we have a lot of clients in Hawaii that are using Salesforce at varying levels mm -hmm. and they all struggle with trying to find an administrator, even the most fundamental skill set. Um, so we talked about some opportunities there and I was really, I was He's, he's trying to, Victor's trying to get certified now and he's right, like right. working on these things. And I'm like, you know, I think that, you know, to be honest, talent pool in Hawaii is tough. Yep. And many of our customers are asking for, even they come to me and they're like, hey, do you know anybody that can do these things? And yep. I'll kind of see what I can figure out. But it's a, it's a, it's a great idea. And you know, in other words, I'm saying it's a fantastic idea. And I was really, really happy to hear about it. And even last night, many people, we had a, we had a gathering last night, a fireside chat with one of our clients <laughs> and a lot of people were in attendance. And, yeah. um, when I was telling them about purple Maya, they were like, Oh, that's cool. Like that might be a great opportunity for clients to have, to start develop, you know, get someone with base knowledge, but yeah. help develop their skill set along with. Them. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's a win-win, right? Because the, the community has a need, obviously, with if they're fundamentally using Salesforce to get uh, to grow their business um, and looking to expand, for example, um, they may not necessarily have the skill sets or want to outsource those skill sets. They could take advantage of the opportunity to also uh, support the community and it's also learning Absolutely. those skill sets. Um, and so it's just kind of That's a circular win-win awesome. all around, right? Yeah. Totally awesome. Yeah. So speaking about Hawaii, and I just mentioned the talent pool is one of the challenges. You were here, then you left. Yes. And now you're kind of look. I mean, you know, you're giving back, which is awesome. What do you see, you know, just as a as from your view as some of the challenges that you think businesses might be facing? Yeah. Um, maybe some things that could be improved, I guess. But what challenges do you see from your vantage point? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think... What's interesting is there's a beauty and a curse with with technology, right? Especially for things like the internet. Like at times, like in my hometown, for example, um, fellow neighbors, uh, other friends, you know, they might express a frustration, for example, with like how many, you know, how many more tourists they tend to see in our hometown and why they're not in Waikiki. And I said, well, you know, there's a number of things, right? Like you have TripAdvisor, you have Airbnb, Airbnb <laughs> you have, um, you have all this technology and all this information fundamentally on the internet that gives people access, right? To make choices. And it, you know, in that sense, they want a different experience than just, um, what you see here in, in, in Honolulu or Waikiki, but the, the point is, it's becoming a global. If you if you haven't seen it already, and uh, it's a global economy, mm -hmm. right? Access to information has made it a lot more competitive, um, and so, you know, for businesses here, or any state or any city, I think it's necessary. If you're trying to grow your business or maintain your business, you have to be mindful of that global inclusion. Mm -hmm. and be open to to that absolutely um, and technology again the the blessing is it gives you access but the curse can be it gives other people access too so how do you right. adapt right yeah um and that's one of the things you and i were talking about um before was the i think we refer to it as you refer to it maybe as the competition blinders right and i i can say like many of our customers now have come to us and they're like you know, I always lived in this space where I was it. Everybody came to me. Yep. I would get all the referrals. Right. I didn't have to go out and hunt for, for my business. Yep. And now they're coming to me saying, I need something like Salesforce to help me become competitive and yep. help me to like actually get out there and hustle for my deals. Absolutely. And so it seems like that, that sh there's been this mind shift um, and that exactly what you mentioned. There's yep. the competition that's coming in going, sure. okay, well, great. I mean, obviously, we've seen an influx of different individuals that have moved here for opportunity and see an opportunity 
to build a business, a lifestyle uh, here in the islands. But they it, that opportunity is, hey, there's a certain there's a certain situation that may not be served, mm-hmm. no, no matter what industry, right? Um, and in that, you know, while obviously relationships and the closeness uh, of those relationships are great, um, we're starting to realize like being aware of what needs to be communicated in those relationships is also equally important. And so technologies like Salesforce, again, kind of giving you that customer 360 point of view um, might be able to give a, a customer, a client, a business, uh, you know, that competitive advantage, right? Um, and so in that sense, it's, you know, certain businesses have to be aware that it's a global economy. There's a there's a competitive market out there. People are very interested. They see business opportunities here in Hawaii, and they're going to come in and take advantage of mm-hmm. that. So leverage things you can to stay competitive, yep. right? Um, that would kind of be my my best takeaway. Hawaii is actually really unique in that sense, um, where I think because of relationships, because of things like the sense of aloha and and our uh, mindfulness around the customer, the, the customer experience, um, whether that's in the visitor hospitality industry or even beyond, like we have that opportunity to really mm-hmm. extend ourselves that unique differentiator along with technology, but yeah. use technology in that way to really set yourself apart. Agreed. So. And that's why I love Purple Maya too, because it's also that investment in people yes. to help you you know, continue to take things forward, right? Yep. You've got to invest. Yes. I mean, I think that's another kind of aspect of Hawaii and businesses that I talk to is recognizing, okay, this is going to take an investment and it's an investment in not only, you know, technology and right. all of that, but it's the people Yep. and all that comes together, like exactly what you just described. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and just again, kind of going back to my experience with Salesforce, they spend the time and they spend the money um, and they have programs that they try to foster up leveling, empowering staff, right? Um, Because they recognize that when you do so, you end up also creating an opportunity for growth within the, you know, for the company themselves with some great ideas and fostered support and things of that cohesion, things of that sort. So yeah, I think that's pretty important as a takeaway for a lot of businesses if they're not already doing it. So what's your... What's your hope for Hawaii? Um, my hope for Hawaii. Oh, that's a that's a wide one. A, I don't know. Maybe you we should can take it the, so many different ask directions. The audience, what's our hope? What's our hope for Hawaii? Um, our hope for her. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I'm just asking because you know I feel like you've got an interesting perspective. I look at you and I see someone who was here. Um, left for unique opportunities, obviously yep. around at that time dot com. I'll still say dot com because that's just my <laughs> my thing. Right, right. And then, you know, coming and coming full circle, right? To for, in this give back mode. Yeah. And I think it's really cool. And I'm just thinking like, wow, I wonder what I mean, and even to go from a tourism degree or what was it tourism yeah. management? Yeah. And then and then having a career shift into technology. I mean, solving business problems with technology. Sure. So I don't know. I just look at you and I think like what would what does he ha- how would you like to see things? I don't know. What would be um, a cool goal, I guess? You like, know, what I'd love to see actually is when we move from through education, through access of information, right, is to allow individuals to kind of think beyond some of the normal lines of day-to-day activity. And what I mean by that is everything from, you know, say we're in the construction world today and you can, you know, we're staring at a ton of these different cranes out here in the these businesses and large construction companies, but it'd be awesome to see not only construction companies that are locally owned, but perhaps because of our relationship with technology is having individuals based here from here that are developing IP or intellectual Mm -hmm. property that serves that particular industry. So not just for Hawaii, Yep. But the idea is that you can take that property, that intellectual property, whether it's software or services, and extend that to out of state, mm-hmm. uh, you know, across the country, yep. across the globe. Yep. Again, being mindful of this global competitive economy, right? 
I love that. Dang, that was a good one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, and, and the crazy part is we are, Hawaii's actually can be, in my opinion, the subject matter experts on a variety of different industries, totally whether agree. it be renewable energies, uh, construction, um, tourism and hospitality, right? Mm -hmm. Healthcare services. Um, and take all these sub industries and go that next level of not just providing them here, but providing through, uh, again, technology and services, possibly to become the hub to offer that globally and pulling revenue and pulling skills into the state. Cool. I like it. That's I'm gonna, great. I'm going to take off the political hat. Okay. Now. No, I like it. It's good. Well, I'm, I was wondering if you were going to say everybody a ranger on trailhead or so many oh. ex-certified <laughs> people through. Um, right, right. You know? No, no, sorry. I'm, I'm kinda, You're I kind of. You're going much how, broader. How, yeah, I went, I went You wide. went next level. Went that's good. Wide. Sorry. <laughs> no, um, I, I, that's fantastic. Um, so I have a question of the sure. day for you. Okay. Okay. Um, what is the best advice that you would give to a young person? Because I'm thinking back to your early days in yep. Hawaii, to a young person interested in pursuing a career in technology like you have. Um, oof, that's a that's a that's a good one. Um, I I think the most value that I've the, the most I can recommend is being open to uh, connecting with different individuals. Um, I have four nieces, um, you know, myself, no kids myself, but four nieces. And um, when they were young, uh, one of the things I offered right away was, hey, if you have a curiosity around anything, right, I'll, I'll do everything I can in my power to connect you with people that know that thing, whether it's another fellow Native Hawaiian or our fellow neighbor next door or someone in the industry in the state or even someone outside of the state. But the, the thing I was trying to teach my nieces was be open to uh, learning in a different way, right? And, and a lot of that learning can be just from connecting with individuals. You know, like for the, the person that's standing there with the film, the mm -hmm. camera right now, like mm -hmm. I don't know cameras the way he knows cameras, right. but if I'm curious about cameras, might want to talk to him about cameras, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and having that kind of openness. So as it relates to technology industry, it's like, if you're curious, don't be afraid to ask. Sometimes we, in the islands, we get shame, you know, shame for go ask something we don't know. Sorry, the small pigeon just kind of jumped <laughs> out for a second. Um, but, you know, be yeah. open and be, mm -hmm. be, be, it's okay to ask a question you don't know to people to learn. Learning's good and being curious is even better. Right. The more curious you are, the more you hopefully learn and the more you're able to make the right decisions on the path you want to take, whether that's, oh, yep, yeah, that's the right path. I want to keep going or nope, that's not for me. I think I'm going to go this way. Totally. I love it. It's great advice. Crossing fingers. Let's see if it sticks. <laughs> All right. Wood. It will. All right. Well, I love ending the podcast on a positive note. So with that, thank you, Blaine. Oh, you're, you're very welcome. I feel very fortunate to be here. Thank you so thank much. You. All right. Mm -hmm.